it's getting to a point where uh, in the US and worldwide, mental illnesses and substance use disorders combined are a leading, if not the leading cause of disability. And, uh, and, and part of the reason is that um, what's shown on this graph is that our illnesses strike young. Um, and that provides a particular interest and opportunity for genetics to answer because of course genetics is one way we can identify risk for mental illness um, early in life and, uh, and potentially intervene to prevent a lot of this disability. Uh, I'm gonna click back here. Oh, there we go. Um, another uh, major um, uh, challenge that we face in psychiatry is our diagnoses, which are, as we all know, heterogeneous um, and overlapping. And that's well shown by this Dunn diagram. Um, this happens to be of kids, but it would look similar for adults if you go into a psychiatric clinic. Um, uh, and if, if you do anything more than just the cursory uh, clinical exam, in this case, if you do a, a structured interview, you find that most individuals will meet criteria from multiple psychiatric disorders. Um, in, uh, in this study, the average number of diagnoses assignable to a child presenting for care at, at a child and adolescent mental health clinic was 2.9. And I like to say that it's unlikely there are 2.9 things wrong with the average child's brain. It's just that we don't describe it well. And of course, within these circles, these circles hide a lot of heterogeneity that are diff difficult to parse. In, in the field of genetics, we've gotten really far by using uh, very, very large data to make up for the fact that our diagnoses are, are heterogeneous and noisy. Um, but uh, in, in, if we want to apply that genetic information back to patients, we do need to think about how to bust up the heterogeneity. Um, a third area that we consider a challenge in psychiatry is biomarkers in the area. And again, genetics has the potential to be helpful. It's a very, very simple challenge. We have no biomarkers. Biomarkers in medicine are used to uh, help with diagnosis, yes, but also help guide treatment and, uh, and then also um, help uh, predict course for patients and identify uh, the underlying causes for their illnesses. And, and we have zero biomarkers in psychiatry. And again, genetics has the potential to help us there. And then finally, the, of course, the long-term goal of any, um, um, any basic science, including genetics and psychiatry, is indeed to uh, progress and, and improve treatments. Um, and so um, the... Uh, we have to acknowledge that our treatments need improvement. Uh, this is the, the famous STAR-D study that we supported some years back showing that basically even after four rounds of antidepressants, one third of people are not getting better. Uh, and, um, and then actually what's less uh, well known about that study is it showed that even if you respond to the first treatment um, that you, um, the first treatment that you respond to it here in the purple line, within a year, you're gonna relapse. Uh, uh, and uh, it's, of course, the, the relapse rates are higher if you had uh, responded to the second, third, or fourth treatment and not to the first. So uh, you put those challenges together and then add a, a final challenge. So we have high burden, poor diagnoses, no biomarkers, mediocre treatments, and um, we have really have zero strategies for prevention in psychiatry. Um, and, uh, and that's really important, again, uh, this brings up the issue of the fact that these things are happening when young. And so if we could achieve prevention, even just to, to, to uh, minimally decrease risk for illness, uh, we could have a big impact on burden of illness. Okay, so what are the opportunities? Obviously, genetics is an opportunity. Um, uh, we now have hundreds of clues for some psychiatric disorders and across all psychiatric disorders towards biology that, uh, that these genetic um, uh, uh, studies have given us. Um, and that's uh, a tremendous opportunity to take advantage of. And I'll point out several different ways we might take advantage of those opportunities in the rest of the talk. The two other areas that I think are really important to consider and intersect with genetics are uh, the revolution in neural delve into the specific circuit elements that guide behavior. Um, and uh, this image illustrates that well. It's a, it's a slice through the hippocampus, the dentate gyrus of the hippocampus, and the brain bow mouse. Um, using genetic tricks, we can gain in, um, specific access to specific circuit elements. We can observe them. We can monitor them during behavior. We can manipulate them, make them more activity, give them more activity, less activity, change 
uh, their molecular structures inside those cells. So these are a tremendous opportunity to delve more deeply into uh, but also um, have the potential to help us develop novel therapeutics. And then there's a third opportunity that, uh, that also, I think, intersects well with genetics, and that's a combination, that, that's what I'm calling computational psychiatry, and I mean by that uh, a combination of theoretical and computational approaches that uh, help us both understand uh, the brain and make predictions based off of uh, brain activity, behavior, and other, uh, and, and other um, ways of measuring our patients. There are three broad areas, and I'll go into more detail in a moment about them, three broad areas that I think are particularly relevant for psychiatry within the rubric of computational psychiatry. Uh, the first being biophysical modeling, that is uh, using what we know about the brain to try to um, understand how it works, but at a very mathematical level. Uh, second being computational phenotyping, that's breaking down behavior into chunks that we think correspond to the neural circuit elements that actually drive those behaviors, uh, and using mathematical formulisms to describe them, characterize them, and, uh, and study them further. And the third area being uh, almost self-explanatory data mining using big data approaches, machine learning, et cetera, uh, to look at large data sets and try to um, understand something about the, the structure of psychiatric illness, uh, maybe mechanism, uh, but most importantly, make predictions based upon that data that will help us in lots of different ways in psychiatry. So uh, that's what I see as the challenges and opportunities. The challenge being, challenges being the heavy burden, difficulties with diagnosis, um, the lack of biomarkers, mediocre treatments, and no preventative measures. And the opportunities uh, in genetics, in neural circuits, and in computational psychiatry give us the potential to really change our ability to deal with those challenges. And now I'll try to explain what I mean a little bit more. But let me pause just for a moment and make sure that people are able to follow. Uh, and, uh, and see if there are any questions before we move on. Yep, sounds good. So um, in the Q&A section, if you wanna raise your hand or if you wanna post a question in the Q&A box, please go ahead. Um, we'll pause for a minute or two to allow you to do that. Um, Josh, we've actually broken Zoom, so there's 110 people on the line, and wow. apparently that's, that's the limit. So we're trying urgently to see if we can get the cap lifted. So we'll do what we can. Okay, should I continue then? Um, I'm just, no one's asked a question. Let me give one more sec in case somebody's typing. I see we're up to 114. Oh, but that includes the four of you, I guess. Yeah. Okay. I guess I'll continue. Please. Okay. So, um, what do I mean by genetics as a vehicle towards understanding? So... Oops, went a little too fast there. Um, on one level, it's really rather straightforward, right? We use the identification of loci and genes um, that we've been able to identify through uh, these genetic studies that you are all driving and leading um, uh, to uh, increase our understanding of psychiatric illness. That's basically what I, what I mean, what we all mean, and, and a lot of this is obvious to most of you. Um, we now have some tens of genes that are associated with ASD uh, at a, gene, a level that we're uh, confident in, uh, correcting for all the genome-wide multiple comparisons. These are uh, many of them here from this 2018 preprint. Um, we have, uh, the nice thing about these is these are, uh, these genes which are of relatively large effect sizes are of course easier clues to biology. We, we at least think we know the genes involved and we can begin studying those genes and actually even the mutations that are present in individuals with autism uh, to begin to probe biology. Um, I think pathways forward from this towards understanding are a little bit clearer and also uh, th than other forms of genetic information, which we'll get into in a minute. But uh, also, while we are pursuing understanding, I think it's important to recognize that where possible, we should probably be all trying to move this information towards treatment. And, and there's two basic ways to do that, of course. One is genetic treatments that might seek to repair the mutations. Uh, and prevent the onset of illness. And then we need to think about, you know, two variables, uh, when and where. 
and multiple technologies that would be needed to fix those uh, genetic mutations in the right place at the right time. Um, so, so these uh, high risk, uh, uh, sorry, uh, these rare but high impact alleles provide a, we, we think, quicker window into understanding. Um, the problem being that we, we don't know how generalizable the information that we're going to get from these alleles is towards the bulk of individuals with autism and other psychiatric disorders. Um, the other, um, I see there's a question. Should I pause now and answer it? Oh, what does he mean when no biomarkers in psychiatry? Um, I mean, no biomarkers, period. And I, I realize that maybe, um, oh, you want me to turn off my email? Uh, I, I might be able to do that. We'll see. Um, uh, what I mean by no biomarkers is that, exactly that, no biomarkers. And I'll fight anyone on this. We have no clinically useful biomarkers in psychiatry. I recognize there are lots of attempts to create them, and there are some that look promising, but there are none that we can point to that someone, uh, a psychiatrist, could actually use in practice to guide clinical decision-making or inform patients. And uh, I don't think it's worthwhile arguing about that for now, but I'm happy to do that at a later point. Okay, getting back to genetic risk for ASD. So, uh, so we have these high impact mutations, there are windows into biology, there are potential windows into treatment. We should be thinking about that and we are thinking about that. Uh, but at the same time, we don't know how generalizable they are. On the other end of the spectrum, as you all know, we have GWAS hits. Uh, these represent uh, places in the genome for the most part, rather than individual genes. And of course, they, uh, for the vast majority of them, represent alleles that contribute to risk, but it contribute a very small amount to that risk. So they're clear windows into biology, but it's less clear how to proceed. And we'll talk about that in a moment. In terms of understanding genetic predisposition, this is the way we used to think about it. Uh, and this is the, the simplistic version, right? You have a gene mutation, on the one hand, it leads to, to some disease phenotype on the far right of the slide. Um, and we're trying to understand how that mutation leads to the phenotype. Uh, a full understanding would require an understanding of the molecular events within cells that proceed from the mutation, that are consequences of the mutation, uh, the cellular processes that are disrupted, how that affects circuit function, how circuit function changes the activity patterns across neural systems, and then how that activity guides uh, 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 or results in the behaviors that we see in disease. I would argue strongly that um, exploiting genetic information to explain disease phenotypes across each of these uh, multiple levels of the nervous system is crucial if we're to find optimal treatments because we don't know where, at what level, our treatments should be directed. We have lots of treatments in psychiatry that attack cellular processes uh, you know, receptor antagonists and the like. Uh, we even have a few that uh, affect neural systems processes like uh, deep brain stimulation, electric, electroconvulsive therapy, uh, TMS, et cetera. Um, and we have a, a number of successful treatments in psychiatry that affect the behavioral level. So uh, we know already that we can attack psychiatric disease from multiple levels of analysis. So we, we have the incentive to try to understand across these multiple levels of analysis. But the recognition that most psychiatric uh, predisposing genes are not large effect size mutations make this uh, prospect of trying to understand genetic predisposition much more complex. And again, you all know that. We have multiple genes, we have environmental factors, and they interact across multiple levels of the nervous system, not through a linear fashion, presumably, but through some sort of web where multiple causes at the level of a gene result in multiple effects at the level of cells, circuits, and systems, and we don't really understand the structure of these pathways that go from genes, from, from causes uh, to uh, behavioral outcomes. And of course, these hours really should be uh, double-ended because behavior can feed back onto the neural systems, particularly during development, but really throughout lifetime uh, through plasticity processes. So that's the complexity we're trying to deal with. We hope that there's, uh, well, we know there's some degrees of convergence, that is multiple genes can contribute, say, to the similar uh, cellular effects. I'll point out, of course, the well-known fact that many 
genes for uh, that are implicated in autism and schizophrenia are um, are genes that affect synaptic function. So we could say that's maybe a point of convergence. There is also likely divergence. Um, we can imagine how synaptic function deficits might cause multiple different phenotypes at the level of neural systems and circuits, and how that might cause uh, multiple phenotypes of behaviorally. What we hope for is some form of critical convergence. That is, by analyzing all these genes and their biological effects, we might find uh, one or a few points of convergence within the nervous system where we can direct a therapy that's going to be generalizable, that's not going to be private to a particular uh, individual that is a particular set of mutations. But this is really at this point a hope or a hypothesis. And, uh, and what we're trying to do is figure out ways that we can get, gather evidence in favor or uh, against this hypothesis. Obviously, it's an important one because if we could show convergence, then that would be a point of attack for treatment. Um, how are we going about this? I would say that this is an area that we still need help in. I don't think we really understand how to do um, biology on, if you will, a genomic scale. That is how to understand how multiple interacting genes and environmental factors uh, affect the nervous system across multiple levels to, to cause change. We have a number of projects that we are funding in NIMH. Many of you are probably familiar with them. Uh, that try to address this. Uh, uh, if you look at this slide that uh, I want to thank uh, Gita Santil at, at NIMH for, for creating um, for a manuscript that she's working on. Uh, on the left hand, lower left hand side, you see this yellow dot that says PGC. This is more on the discovery side. Let's find the genes and molecules that are important for psychiatric disorders. Um, as a way for progressing from gene hits to, uh, to molecular and cellular processes, we have the Psych Encode project that seeks to understand how risk genes change transcription and other cellular uh, uh, processes um, in, uh, in real brain neurons and real brain tissue. Um, we have uh, moving uh, up this chain from genes through to behavior. Uh, we have a number of projects that fall into the Convergent Neuroscience Initiative that really try to span multiple levels of the nervous system uh, to look at the effects of risk genes on cellular circuit uh, and even systems level properties. Uh, we have a, a, a package of projects uh, uh, under the Enigma motif which try to look at the effects of uh, genes uh, and behavior on uh, neural imaging properties and neural systems. So we have a number of different um, large projects. We can't really call them pilot projects because they are big and they are expensive and they are consortium based. But in a sense, they are pilot projects because we don't really know how to do this thing, how to, how to move from genes through this web uh, to behavior and look for convergence and look for divergence and understand mechanisms. So that's an area that we're really trying to figure out. And we hope that through these efforts, we will identify um, some pathways forward. But I would say we're still uh, in the hunt. Um, a little bit more detail on the convergent neuroscience approach. Uh, the idea of uh, different projects are doing different things. One idea um, that is part of a, of, of a consortium project is to try to look at the role of uh, risk loci that are relatively highly penetrant on uh, biological effects in uh, human cells derived from iPSCs uh, across a cellular, molecular, uh, anatomical, and physiological level as far as you can get with those cells. Um, what kind of iPSCs? Well, one approach, and we don't know the right approach, would be to take you know relatively low risk and relatively high risk from uh, polygene risk scores uh, for, in this case, we're talking about autism spectrum disorder, and uh, and 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 that way we can study the effects of the the genetic background on these penetrant risk loci, and then uh, somehow move these findings from human cells uh, into mice to look uh, for the effects of these high impact mutations in the setting of different genetic backgrounds, and that's the challenging part on behavior and, uh, and, and neural systems physiology that one can't do in, in human cell models. Um, and, and, uh, and where to look, what to do, well, uh, one thing to try to feed into this is to do uh, network analysis on genes, which many of you have been doing, to try to figure out what systems and, and circuits to be involved in. So that gives you an idea as to where we see genetics moving uh, as a vehicle towards understanding of psychiatric illness. I'm going to just check to see if there's another question. Uh, doesn't look like there are any more now. 
Um, so I'll, I'll just pause again and check in and make sure that, uh, that you're not losing me and I'm not going to, uh, to, I'm not fading out too much. No, things are, it sounds good. Um, the attendees could pre-type questions into a text editor so you can paste them in uh, when the time comes. Great. Okay, so uh, that's, that's, that's the, the landscape of genetics. You know, just to sum up, I think we are really excited about the progress that the PGC and others have been making in genetics, identifying all these loci. The challenge is moving that towards understanding, and we have a number of different vehicles to try to get us there, and we're not really sure what's going to work. And we're looking for creative ideas, um, uh, but we are very excited about it. Uh, Computational psychiatry. Uh, I'm going to veer away from genetics for a while to, to make sure that we're all on the same page in terms of that so that you all understand what I mean by computational psychiatry. And then we'll come back uh, about opportunities to merge that with genetics. Uh, so what do I mean by computational psychiatry? Uh, again, it's a variety of approaches from data mining uh, through biophysical modeling to modeling of behavior, which I call computational phenotyping. I want to go through those three. Uh, first, uh, first, I'm going to talk about uh, biophysical modeling. And um, I think if we start with our conundrum of multiple genes leading through pathways through uh, cellular circuit systems level effects to behavior, one can appreciate the need to be able to do uh, sort of rigorous hypothesis testing uh, about the mechanistic links across these levels. And on the one hand, one way to do that uh, is um, to um, uh, one way to do that is uh, to, to, to do causal tests, you know, uh, induce a genetic uh, mutation in a cell line, look at the effects on cells, uh, mimic those effects on cells in an intact circuit and measure the effect on the circuit, et cetera, et cetera. But interpreting those results can be challenging, and, um, and, and even though uh, the experiment might provide evidence in favor or against, uh, without a strong theoretical and computational grounding, we can't really understand the strength with which that evidence uh, tests the, uh, uh, that experiment tests the hypothesis. And I'll give you an example of how I think a computational modeling can be helpful in this way. And uh, it's an example that comes out of Han Hannah Monnier's lab, uh, trying to look at a particular physiologic level, neural circuit level uh, phenotype, uh, the relationship between hippocampal theta and gamma frequency oscillations, and their uh, and their effects on a, 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 a and the effects of a, a particular molecular uh, uh, change, uh, the um, uh, 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 of a particular receptor on a particular interneuron subtype. So what we're trying to do here is bridge the level between cells and circuits using computational mapping. It's actually sort of molecules, cells, and circuits, and you'll see what I mean in a minute. So what, what are oscillations in the hippocampus? Many of you, again, will know this, but some of you won't, so I'll describe it. Uh, in here in the black trace, you can see the, uh, an actual neural recording from within the hippocampus during a behavior in, in, in a, I believe this is from a, a mouse. Um, and the black trace indicates the voltage at the tip of an electrode implanted within the hippocampus. And you can see that that voltage, this is extracellular voltage, it represents summed activity of many, many synapses in the hippocampus all at once. That voltage goes up and down over time across multiple frequency ranges. There's this slower up and down, we call that the theta oscillation, it's occurring about eight times a second. And then there's the faster stuff that's riding on top of that slow oscillation. That faster stuff is the gamma oscillation. It's happening around 40 times up and down per second. And what's been known is what's clearly illustrated in this figure uh, is that gamma oscillations are timed to the theta cycle. So you can see in this figure how these fast up and downs are occurring, particularly on the peaks of the theta cycle and much less during the troughs of the theta cycle. And this is called theta gamma modulation or theta, or gamma, uh, theta nested gamma. Uh, and uh, and uh, you know, there are lots of reasons why it might be particularly interesting to study it, but let's skip all that and just get to the modeling piece. So. Uh, a number of different investigators, uh, led really uh, by Nancy Capel in this manner, have created mathematical models that can explain the nesting of gamma oscillations within theta in a rel relatively simplified circuit. You take a bunch of excitatory neurons here in 
replicated by E, and two different kinds of inhibitory neurons, the T neurons and the I neurons, wire them up according you know, to uh, something similar to the way they're actually wired up in, in cortices, in, in the cortex and in the hippocampus, and uh, give them synaptic weights, and even not just weights, but synaptic components, receptors, et cetera, that are more or less what we understand exist in these neuronal types. And then you can uh, make this uh, uh, computerized version of a neural circuit oscillate, uh, and, and it oscillates in something reminiscent of what happens in real life. So the black trace here on the bottom is in the computer, voltage changing within the extracellular fluid of an electrode embedded in this, uh, you know, uh, um, theoretical circuit. And you can see that the predicted voltage changes look something like the upper trace actually happens. So you have a theta oscillation that's happening rather slowly. You have these faster gamma oscillations and the gamma oscillations are happening at the peak rather than the trough of the theta cycle. So it, it's almost like uh, the equivalent in, in, in biochemistry is like an in vitro prep. We distill out what we think might be necessary uh, for the circuit level phenomenon, and then we can show using mathematical computations that indeed with this bare minimum set of features, we can create something that looks like uh, or that mimics aspects of the whole intact system. Now, why is that useful? Well, we can then make a hypothesis. And a uh, hypothesis this group asked was, what if we took out one particular subunit of one particular receptor? And, and we knew from gene expression that if you knocked out the gamma-2 subunit of the GABA-A receptor, that that should disrupt two of these various synapses in this microcircuit. The synapses that go from the T to the I neurons and the synapses that go from I neurons to themselves, they rely on this gamma-2 subunit. And if you were to eliminate those synapses, that, that subunit, you would eliminate those synapses. And then you can ask in a computer, well, what would that do to theta gamma nesting. And what you would find in the computer is you get theta oscillations, slow stuff, and you get gamma oscillations, the fast stuff. But now the gamma is happening throughout the entire theta cycle. There's no relationship between the theta rhythm and the gamma rhythm anymore. And then you can, of course, because you can knock out a, a subunit in a mouse, you can then ask what happens in the real mouse and you get something similar. You get theta, you get gamma, but there is no modulation of gamma by theta. So uh, this is all by way of saying if you can distill it down to its component parts, then you can make predictions about the effects of knocking out elements of those componentry. And how I think this might be relevant for genetics, of course, is if we go back to our case where we don't have a linear pathway from gene to behavior, we have this web, we can now, in a computer at least, ask what are the effects of multiple small changes in genes and environmental factors on cellular processes? What effects, would, how would that ripple through to circuit level and even systems or behavior level phenomenon if we can build accurate biophysical models. So biophysical modeling is one important component. I think it's particularly relevant to our uh, understanding of, of genetics and I think it'll be very useful moving forward. Uh, the second area I wanna talk about is, is phenotypes and in particular, of course, behavioral phenotypes and what I'm calling computational phenotypes which is trying to break down behavior into its component parts so that we can understand how it works. And what do I mean by that? Well, uh, I'll give you one example that came out of Ray Dolan's lab by Rob Rutledge, trying to break down a very complex behavior, depression, or rather mood, uh, into its component parts. And uh, Rob created a game where uh, you can play in a smartphone where you take a chance on winning a, a large award or versus a no award reward, or uh, press a different button and you get a reward every time. This game plays into a, a, a well-known described phenomenon of how we learn about rewards. And Rob had a hypothesis that this might be related to how happy we are moment to moment. The hypothesis is here. It looks complex math, but it's actually relatively simple to understand. So every time the person played the game, uh, they would play multiple trials. And every few trials, they would rate their mood at, 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 at a given time uh, and on a scale, say, 0 to 10. Uh, uh, and or zero to 100. And um, Rob predicted that the rating of how happy they are in the particular moment is some function of the, the, their behavior on the test and how many rewards they're getting, sorry, on, on this game. And, and the specific hypothesis was that happiness would be equal to uh, W0, that is your baseline happiness, how happy were you when you started playing the game, plus a function of the rewards, the points you racked up on the game, 
plus some function of what you expected to get on each trial. Every time you press this button, the gain 45 button, you would get a known reward. Uh, but every time you press the other one, you don't know what to expect. And the brain actually builds a model of what to expect based on probability. And you can calculate that, uh, that expectation for each trial for that individual. So you have happiness equals baseline happiness plus past reward plus expected values plus the last factor is reward prediction error, the difference on each trial between what you expect and what you actually got. Now, why is this useful? Well, you all know if we took a bunch of happy people and a bunch of sad people and put them in a scanner, you don't get much. You don't get anything replicable. But if you take people who play this game and put them into the scanner and ask, well, where are these different components, you find that you get something replicable. So, um, First of all, the model works for any individual, and he did this across hundreds of, or maybe thousands of individuals. Um, you can predict how happy they are moment to moment using this model. So blue is the actual ratings and red is the model fit uh, uh, based upon these, these values, these factors. But importantly then, when you ask instead of where is happiness in the brain, let's say where is reward prediction error, you find that reward prediction error is in the ventral striatum and the medial prefrontal cortex. And although the location of happiness in the brain is not replicable across studies, the location of, of, of uh, reward prediction error is. And then finally, we can use that to break down a depression and try to image depression. Um, and, uh, and what's been shown is that basically people who are depressed have differences in their reward processing and differences in reward prediction error imaging in, 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 across multiple studies. So that, that's computational phenotyping. The last I'll, I'll spend just a little time on because you all know it, big data approaches. You guys use big data approaches in, in genetics every day, uh, but we can apply those approaches I'm sorry, my email is going a little nuts now. Let me see if I can't uh, quit out of it at least and see if that goes. Let me go back and let me stop and ask, can people see the slides again? Yep, all good. Okay, so, um, so uh, uh, big data approaches, how do we, how do we use these approaches? Uh, uh, and, and in particular, uh, I think this is particularly useful for biomarkers. Um, so uh, just like you can take a whole bunch of, of people get their genetic information and uh, and use it to smooth out the noise. You can you can do that with neuroimaging. So in this study by Drysdale and Liston, uh, they took a thousand people who are depressed. They did functional connectivity, looking at how activity goes up and down and up and down over time across multiple brain regions. And for each pair of brain regions, let's say these two gray dots, you can see that these two brain dots that brain these two brain regions, their activity tends to go up and down together over time. Uh, other brain dot, uh, other places within the brain uh, activity isn't as well correlated. And on the right-hand side of this uh, slide is a map of the connectivity for one individual. Some areas are very tightly connected. Those are the bright ones. Some areas are weakly connected. Those are the dim ones. And uh, the, the point isn't the details of the map, but the fact is that you can construct a map for every individual. And when you do that for a thousand people, you can ask, how, uh, how similar are individual maps and are there different kinds of maps? And there's lots of discussion about the right ways to cluster data I won't get into, but this particular study found that there were four different types of maps. And importantly, the maps differed in terms, uh, sorry, the individuals with these different types of maps differed in terms of their response to a particular treatment, a particular transcranial magnetic stimulation treatment. Now, in, in partial answer to that, earlier question, what do I mean by no biomarkers? You could say this is a valid biomarker for depression. We can sort people into different map types and make a prediction about treatment. I would argue though this might be uh, theoretically a biomarker. It's not a good practical biomarker only because we don't know that these people in biotype two, map type two, that are not responding to TMS, whether they're gonna respond to anything. And although neurologists might be perfectly happy to tell you, uh, oh, you have that type of depression we can do nothing for, and I'm not gonna treat you, psychiatrists generally try to treat their patients. And so it's not good enough to have a biomarker that, uh, that just um, tells us something about the patient. We want it to be clinically useful. In, in this case, clinical utility would be, which treatment should I try? So what we need to know is, and not whether to treat or not. So what we need to know is whether this MAP type two patients with MAP type 2 would respond to some other treatments, then I could do a scan. I could say, okay, sit in a scanner for a half hour, we'll get your functional connectivity measure, and from your MAP, uh, we'll predict whether you need uh, TMS versus cognitive behavioral therapy. 
So that's what I mean about moving uh, uh, towards biomarkers that we can actually use clinically. Um, so now, how, how might genetics fit into the, uh, this uh, big data uh, biomarker phenotype? I think uh, in some ways we can already use genetics, if you will, as a biomarker. We can, we can get a polygene risk score, for example, for an individual patient, and, uh, and we can predict their level of risk for schizophrenia. And certainly for a patient with autism who has a high risk allele, uh, that's, that is also, a, I would say, a, a, a useful biomarker that's, I guess, uh, moving towards clinical treatment already. But I think it's important to recognize that uh, the polygene risk score is only going to get you so far. But if we could incorporate, in addition to genetic risk, patterns of brain activity, behavioral markers, life experience markers, we might do a better job of clustering and we might be able to do a better job of prospectively predicting what treatments are gonna work for which patients and what kind of illness uh, that patient is going to have. Uh, and so I think integrating genetic approaches with other measurement approaches on, uh, in, in, in large scale is one way forward to harnessing genetics and computation uh, and particular big data approaches uh, to develop clinically useful biomarkers. Okay. Uh, so uh, most of the way through the talk now, I want to talk about some specific opportunities to harness genetics uh, that we see uh, and then, uh, and, and then uh, move forward. So again, we're talking about trying to, uh, uh, when we think about genetics, uh, we think about multiple causes contributing through multiple levels of the nervous system to multiple outputs. Uh, genetics is going to help us model mechanisms across levels. Uh, that's, that's one thing. And I talked in particular about how we want to use biophysical approaches as well exper as experimental approaches to make these links between and across multiple levels. Uh, I guess I've already talked about this too, uh, multimodal biomarkers. So let's uh, take an approach where we combine genetics with uh, clinical diagnoses, with cognitive and behavioral measures, functional imaging, EEG measures, everything that we can find out about an individual um, to try to develop using big data approaches, algorithms that will allow us to do clinically useful things like stratify patients into different treatment groups, uh, monitor the effects of treatment, uh, predict the effects of treatment, predict the course of illness, uh, et cetera. And, and I think um, uh, if we pay attention to these red things down below, feasibility, accuracy, and reproducibility, uh, genetics is wonderful for feasibility. It's, it's cheap. It's easy. Uh, it can be very accurate, and it is uh, incredibly reproducible because that doesn't really change over the time. But incorporating other feasible, accurate, and reproducible biomarkers into algorithms uh, that will enable us to do what we need to do uh, uh, to help our patients is something that could be really, really helpful. Uh, these purple boxes indicate some choices we have to make uh, as we move forward with studies of algorithmic uh, biomarkers using big data approaches. Um, do we want to try to apply uniform algorithms uh, that, are, uh, that will uh, be useful perhaps for, for, for a clinician, but may not be truly flexible enough for a scientist? Um, how do we uh, make that trade off? And uh, a second area is uh, when we talk about uh, algorithmic approaches is uh, we already have lots of data available to us. Um, do we study algorithms with currently existing data, or do we design what could be very large and very expensive studies to do prospective trials of these uh, biomarker approaches? Uh, and I think, obviously, uh, we're going to need to do a little bit of both. Um, but but uh, these are the questions that we're wrestling with at, at, at NIMH right now, is how to move forward towards developing these algorithms. Uh, one other approach that I think is, is going to be really uh, useful and important for us to think about uh, uh, combining genetics with these other approaches is uh, our effort to try to improve nosology or, or diagnoses. With these new data sources, whether they be genomics or uh, the computational phenotyping efforts that I'm talking about, uh, the kind of, kind of connectomic biomarkers that I, that I discussed, um, but also our efforts in RDoC to characterize behavior, and, 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 uh, in, 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 which is related to the computational phenotype issue. How do these inform uh, changes in nosology? It, will these actually replace the DSM, or will they help us revise it? Um, will they actually lead to precise phenotypes with precision prognos prognoses, and, and, or, or are they uh, are not going to help us get beyond broad classes? And one, one, one question to answer these things is to use mathematics 
mathematical approaches to combine uh, um, uh, the, the sort of biomarker stuff uh, with the di diagnostic uh, impressions from clinicians and use that to um, back propagate our understanding from uh, 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 these observable phenotypes uh, through what we call latent constructs, that is ideas about how the brain works, uh, 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 hidden physiologic states that sometimes we can get access to, but a lot of the time we can't, about neural activity uh, and causes. This is a different way of mapping, if you will, that transition from genes and environmental factors that are causes up here onto the behavioral outputs. But the reason why I'm pointing this out is that this, this, uh, we can actually use this kind of mapping to mathematically move from observation back to causes and from causes out to observations using uh, um, what we call, uh, call a Bayesian approach that asks, how well are we doing now at this mapping process? And how much more can we do with additional information like uh, behavioral measurements, like genetics? And I realize that's a very fast description Description. But one thing that will help us move in this direction is if we can get large data sets that combine clinical data, DSM diagnoses, with behavioral data from, say, computational phenotypes and RDOC, and with the causal data, environmental exposures and, uh, and genes. And there is a database that is coming online that does that. It's the All of Us database. This is an effort to recruit a million adults. They will all get genotyped and eventually get sequenced. They will have electronic health records attached to them. We, in collaboration with all of us, are rolling out efforts to get deep behavioral phenotypes on these million individuals, or on as many of them as we can, uh, and other behavioral assessments. And so we think we will have a database within the next five to 10 years that will enable us to combine behavioral, genetic, and, and clinical information uh, that will allow us to test which types of information are really gonna inform uh, uh, us clinically. Um, that will then result, I think, in better hypothesis building. Um, so with that, um, I, I want to close um, really with uh, moving uh, on the moving forward front, uh, going back to these gene genetics and just reminding us that, yes, we have lots of science to do, uh, but another way forward that NIMH is interested in uh, um, is thinking specifically about how we might skip all the stuff I just talked about, um, how we might uh, move faster towards treatment for at least some individuals with illness by paying attention to the genes and looking for potential targets for treatment within those genes. For the high-risk alleles, as I said before, that might mean genetic approaches aimed at trying to fix the genetic defects, and the questions are where and when. For the low-risk alleles, these uh, common alleles of small effect size, it might mean just taking some educated guesses about which, which genes here might have actual potential targets, uh, uh, for, might be drug, which, sorry, which low cyan are actually associated with what genes and what genes might actually be druggable. And, uh, and it's okay if we make some wrong guesses along that way, um, but we shouldn't be blind to the fact that if there are some things we could move forward into treatment faster with all the understanding that I just went through, uh, we should probably spend a little bit of time and effort uh, um, making uh, testing testing some of those treatment approaches that that are based not on uh, um, not on knowledge but rather on uneducated guesses. Finally, I just want to remind everyone, and this group probably needs no reminding, that we had a, a, a genomics work group of our council. Some of you were on it. Um, that define ways forward. Uh, we put out a number of principal recommendations that I know this group will agree with uh, about the right way to do genetic studies, uh, unbiased approaches being the preferable ones, uh, that we need to proceed with studies looking at all types of genetic va variation, rare, common, se sequences, etc. cetera, um, that uh, going along with some, th some of what I told about our genetic association probably should extend beyond DSM to behavioral and other phenotypes. Um, we are, and you guys were pioneers in developing and sharing research resources. And when we study genes, we should look for those uh, that have genome-wide significance for further study. And with that, I'll close and I'll, uh, I'll be glad to take some questions. Josh, thank you so much for a fascinating forward-looking uh, talk. And um, I'll probably try to get some on your get some FaceTime with you at that NAMI meeting next week. Sounds there are good. three questions pending. Um, if you look at the chat box, there are two. 
And then there's another one in the Q&A box too, which I can, if you can't find that, I'll, I'll read it out to you. Um, there's the, can you see in the chat box, there's one from Hannah? Oh yeah, let me open it up. Uh, okay. Chat. Hana, yes, likewise, there are many prevention randomized controls trials for psychiatric disorders in the mental health field broadly has shown efficacy, no prevention is confusing also. Genetic based prevention is what is meant. Um, yeah, I, perhaps saying no prevention is, is a little bit strong. That's a good point. There are actually things that we can do. Uh, there, the, and I think it's probably safer to say that there are no, I, I don't know, genetic based prevention is the right way to say it. Um, there are few, if any, uh, specific prevention methods that are designed around um, uh, specific risk. And even that, I suppose, should be tempered because we do know there are some prevention efforts that would be tempered to specific risk. For example, if we could reduce exposure to pollutants, we would reduce the risk for, uh, uh, for autism. If we would reduce lead exposures, we would reduce the risk for psychiatric disease generally. So uh, yeah, I'll concede that, that it's probably too strong to say there are no preventions. Uh, and, uh, but but we, we can certainly do a better job at uh, developing preventions that are tailored to what we now know about psychiatric disorders. And, and, and then specifically, just to elaborate a little bit more, um, genetic risk will allow us to do a much better job at testing preventative measures because we can test them in high-risk individuals. And, uh, and, and that, that, uh, that will really enable us to make much faster progress with prevention. And then the next question is from Rosie Hosking, right under Hannes. Are there specific efforts to recruit a certain number of people with psychiatric diagnoses to all of us? Otherwise, they will likely be severely underrepresented. Thanks, Rosie. That is a really important observation. So uh, this is something we, uh, uh, we don't know how, uh, I, I shouldn't say that. This is something that we've been aware of from day one, and we've been working with the, our advocacy communities to publicize uh, the need to join all of us. And, um, and what we don't know yet is how successful we have been. Uh, the electronic health record data is not yet integrated with uh, all of us, but it should be, I've been told, within a year or so. So that's when we'll start to get answers about how underrepresented psychiatric diagnoses are. I anticipate they will be significantly underrepresented, but uh, I don't know. Um, all of us right now, the apparatus that is, you know, sort of recruiting individuals into it is focused on ethnic and socioeconomic diversity uh, and not diagnostic diversity. And so this may be an effort that NIMH will need to underwrite uh, to attempt to recruit individuals with psychiatric diagnoses into all of us at significant rates to be able to look at, for example, things like uh, predictions uh, on treatment. There are some low hanging fruit that I'm hoping will be available to us early in all of us. For example, the rates of depression are high enough and that we might anticipate that at least for moderate to mild forms of depression, we would have adequate representation to ex exam examine, for example, uh, the relationship between genetics and, and uh, other phenotypic predictors of treatment response with uh, antidepressants, for example. So uh, we can anticipate there might be tens or even a hundred or a uh, thousand people with depression in that database uh, we won't know, though, until we get access to the EHRs. And then the next question, if you open the Q&A box, there's a little icon down at the bottom of the Zoom screen. Q&A, yep, I got that. Francis McMahon has, a, has posed a really interesting question. Thanks for a great interview. Where should we set the bar for clinical utilities of biomarkers? You know, three or four groups, top group is 60%, 30% response. So that's a really good question. What would constitute clinical utility? I, I think there are actually good ways uh, to figure that out, uh, but they are economic decisions uh, are, are the primary way. There, is, uh, there are uh, roughly acceptable um, costs uh, 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 for healthcare uh, relative to the burdens uh, that the costs are relieving. So uh, for example, there's roughly uh, uh, acceptable $25,000 uh, per life year uh, 
is an acceptable cost for life-saving treatments. I don't know what the you know generally agreed upon acceptable costs. Uh, or sorry, maybe it's two hundred fifty thousand. Uh, uh, yeah, if I can be order order of magnitude off, then you know I'm not up on this. But anyway, there there are there are generally acceptable costs for this, so we can make the calculations if we had a biomarker that was sixty thirty, uh, and and we knew that getting people into treatment would save people eight weeks of you know, depression, then we can make the economic argument that we have a clinically useful biomarker. But there are other reasons why biomarkers could be clinically useful besides sorting in different treatment groups, and they would require different analyses. Uh, but I think it's a really good question, um, and I think we need to pay attention to that when we think about the design of our experiments. And then in order, the next question was from Daniel Moreno De Luca in the chat box. Uh, okay, thanks for exciting comments on the future of clinical utility. Can you comment on NMH's view between the reconciling the tension between genetic heterogeneity and pleiotropy rising rare variants and the development of convergent algorithms for clinical care? Uh, so that's, that's a good question. I think there are different ways I can take that. And maybe, Daniel, if you want to type in the chat box if I'm not getting it quite right. Um, I think, you know, when we think about, well, you know, a, a genetic variant uh, that has high penetrance, but a lot of pleiotropy, mo many of them have, and I'll think of, for example, the, the one that I've spent uh, much of my career studying in mice, the 22Q11 microdeletion, that's a different story than, than uh, the typical heterogeneity we're talking about, right? We know the etiologic factors in these cases of the large effect size mutations, and I think we can forget about that trying to parse the heterogeneity uh, uh, to a first approximation, we can, we can forget about it. I think, of course, we, we recognize that for the likelihood to get any specific outcome uh, from that uh, in, inciting event is based upon all the other factors, environmental, polygene risk score, et cetera. But, uh, but if we skip all that heterogeneity and focus in on the fact that what we do have is a a strong biological factor, then I think the, the, the first thing we should do for these large effect size mutations is pursue that biology. Understand what is the biology consequent to the particular high at large effect size mutation and look for opportunities to reverse that treatment early before the other heterogeneity and pleiotropy has to play a goal. That's my own personal viewpoint, and I certainly wouldn't inflict that viewpoint on everything we fund, but you're asking me to so that's more of a personal view than an NIMH view. Uh, the, the other aspect of your question, which you know, I'm not sure if, if I was answering the wrong question or not. So the, another aspect that you might be asking about would be when we think about uh, even the polygene risk, there's a lot of overlapping risks. So the, the, the genetic risk, as is, is you all have shown uh, for different psychiatric disorders, overlaps a lot. And so will genetics actually help us parse the heterogeneity? And I don't know the answer to that yet, but I think it's really important for us to ask that. I don't think that the fact that we have these polygenic pathways to general risk doesn't mean that there isn't specificity buried into uh, the either the polygenic patterns or the particular individual patterns that a particular individual has. So I think there's still plenty of room and, and being naive and not uh, a geneticist, maybe I'm wrong, uh, to, to mine the genetics uh, to see if that will help um, uh, um, to parse heterogeneity. And then the next question is back to the Q&A box from Pamela Romero. Pamela Romero, geneticists are largely skeptical of imaging and genetics. Uh, where do I see this multidisciplinary approach going? What sample size should we realistically strive for? I have no clue, Pamela. I'm really sorry, and we don't really know. We have a few studies that we have funded in this area uh, more recently. So we, we funded a lot of stuff that was way underpowered in the past, and we stopped doing that. Um, but we're looking for, and, and I think uh, we have funded a handful of studies that we'll, that are, that from our perspective are designed more to ask the question of what can we do in imaging genetics. For example, studies looking at uh, polygene risk uh, and its effect on imaging. Uh, and, and I don't know where we funded any of these, but I've seen some interesting applications come through uh, looking at pathway level 
level analyses. So, okay, forget the fact of trying to do a gene level analysis in imaging. What about a synapse versus mitochondria versus, you know, uh, immune system genetic factors? Sort of do pathway analyses. I'm butchering that, but so, uh, but I don't think we know that yet, and we are really trying to be strategic in what we fund to looking for studies that will help us not necessarily answer the question of what is going on in imaging genetics, but rather what will it take to answer the question of ge genetics and imaging. And then back to the, the chat box and Todd Lentz. And I should add as a coda to that, if any of you have comments you'd like to make about ways that we can do that, you, you, can, you can make that here and or email us, uh, myself or Tomas Lehner, who's the, you know, my uh, uh, head of gen genomics at, 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 at NIMH. So that, because we, we are really interested in, in intriguing ways to look, uh, to, uh, to, to, to try to move forward on that. Uh, okay, sorry, the next question is from uh, Lentz. Yeah, Todd Lentz on, yeah, in the chat uh, box. Related Related to above, are there planned mechanisms for finding large-scale biomarker research in psychiatric cohorts, or will this be subsumed in all of us? Uh, we don't have any planned uh, calls, but we are very interested in biomarker. I shouldn't say that. Uh, we are very interested in biomarker research. I think there's two basic approaches. One is the kind of large-scale biomarker research. For example, what we've studied, what we've funded in the um, uh, B-SNP. Uh, consortium, and uh, and we're open to applications in that realm. Um, uh, but so we're not saying that all of us is going to do everything. We do think all of us will be important. I think there are other opportunities to use existing or large data sets to do this kind of work. Be that A, B, C, D, uh, which is continuing to develop, or uh, we've done some. Uh, uh, we're doing some disease connectome work, where specific uh, individuals, specific diagnoses are being uh, uh, imaged uh, on a reasonable, I would say, moderate scale, a thousand people or so. Um, so we have some efforts. We're interested in entertaining applications. We don't have any planned calls uh, 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 for that. The other piece of the biomarker research we're really interested in is like the, the Drysdale-Liston uh, 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 paper, but um, you know, efforts to do, I would say, moderate scale stuff, things that we could do with a you know, supramodular you know, 500K to 1 million K to $1 million uh, R01 type thing, where you take a, you know, a reasonable size cohort, several hundred individuals, and, uh, and, and try to do uh, planned, uh, maybe even uh, partly hypothesis-driven methods to test whether, you know, uh, some combination of biomarkers will predict treatment responses, uh, say differential treatment to differential response to different treatments. So we are open to uh, moderate-scale biomarker research and large-scale biomarker research. Um, we are hoping that some of the big things we, we are invested in will, uh, will do that as well. And the next question is just below that one. So Sema Katrine Lee asks, we need to take anonymous guesses about genes that can be used as target for treatment. It means we need to revisit target gene studies. No, 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 sorry. Thank you very much for clarifying that. I don't mean uh, candidate gene approaches, not at all. What I mean is let's, uh, 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 let's take a look. Let's have you know, people who sort of, you know, biologists uh, work with geneticists to take a look at these, I'm gonna put back up, uh, I don't know if I'm sharing it properly. Uh, yeah, we can see it. Way. Uh, the, the treatment, you know, the gene, the gene slide, oops. Um, you know, so there are these hundreds of, uh, of loci now that have been identified. Um, I, already, I think it's pretty obvious for the large effect size mutations, we, you know, if we know that it's a knockdown of CHD8 or whatever, uh, uh, then is there a, something that we can do downstream of CHD8 to compensate for that with a drug? Uh, that's one approach and genetic rescue is another approach and figuring out where and when to do that. So I, th I think that's, that's obvious. What's less obvious is the notion that, okay, so we know that, um, I'll take an easy one because I know people are already working on it. This complement factor four is, I shouldn't say no, there's a high degree of suspicion that that gene is the active thing that's going on in the locus on chromosome, what is it, six, right? Six. So yep. 
Um, so let's see what we can imagine doing. Is that a druggable target? Could we put an antagonist and an ag agonist in, test that in cells, maybe human cells of people with the risk variant versus without the risk variant? What does it do? Um, uh, you know, in other words, yes, we really need to understand deeply the biology of the, the, the complement four pathway. Uh, uh, for the other loci, we need to understand which genes both near the, there and, and far away are affected by it. What are the biological processes, et cetera. But that is gonna be a, a 10 to 20 to 30 year approach, right? That's gonna be Huntington all over. And Huntington, we know the gene, and yet we still, you know, 30, 40 years later, are still struggling to find uh, treatments that come out of it. So are there educated guesses that we make? Are there somewhere buried in this thing some kinases that are easy, easily droppable, <coughs> receptors that we could work on, um, some downstream convergent pathways that we already have drugs available. And can we find ways to examine their potential re uh, treatment uh, uh, relevance for schizophrenia? Can we run, can we just, you know, test these drugs in even the traditional lame ass models, <laughs> preclinical models that we have and see if they have efficacy? You know, we, we, uh, we have to recognize that uh, that the, the knowledge-based pathways are going to take a long time, and there are people suffering with schizophrenia now, uh, and so it'd be interesting to see whether we can't make some educated guesses. I'm not going to bet the horse on this. I'm not going to say, oh, we should take all our money and pursue that, but if there are some educated guesses, it's probably worth an R01 or two or three here. It's probably worth someone talking to you know, a medicinal chemist or, uh, you know, a, a company with a medical library or one of our academic centers to try to figure out uh, how to target, you know, some of these druggable targets just to see. Uh, because, you know, we know that GWAS for hypercholesterolemia actually buried in there are some targets for the drugs that work to lower cholesterol. And, uh, and why not, if that's available to us now, explore the possibility that we might hit upon a, a treatment that's buried somewhere here in that Manhattan plot. That's all I'm trying to say. And then I think the last question will be from Taka Sauda in the Q&A box, please. Got it. Since you mentioned focus on ethnic, socioeconomic, minority recruitment, their efforts at NIMH to make a current genetic knowledge more applicable to minority populations. Yes, Taka, thank you for asking me that. That's a great question. Uh, you're probably all aware that we are in the, we have a project in uh, Southern Africa aimed at increasing the number of genomes in the databases, particularly focused on schizophrenia, uh, but there's lots of control genomes being acquired through other projects. Uh, uh, so uh, that is one of them. We are interested in others as well. And, and we recognize that to make any of this data uh, applicable to populations other than uh, Caucasian, uh, we really need have a lot of work to do. Okay, I th wait. There's actually one uh, final comment, which is you also have a project in Pakistan. Yeah, there you go. Thank you very much. <laughs> thank you. On that on that note, um, Josh, thank you so much for taking the time to give us such an interesting, far ranging, and visionary talk. Well, and, thank you uh, all very much. And and really, I, I encourage. Please feel free to email, tweet, whatever uh, 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 to. Uh, you know, communicate with us about what you think we're, uh, uh, other things we need to think about, um, uh, suggestions, et cetera, along these lines. We're, uh, we're constantly trying to, to do the best we can, but we don't have all the answers even uh, internally or, or in talking with you the way we normally do. So I'm happy to get input. Thank you very much. And thank you for breaking Zoom. <laughs> That's it for today, everybody. Thank you very much. Thank you very much.